Happy Sunday, Church, and welcome to our online service. We're glad you could join us today as we steadily settle into the second term. Mel and I have some opportunities to share with you later in the service, and these include a couple of Hope Center courses and this month's baptism sign-up. Remember to regularly check the Happening at Hatfield section on our website homepage for the latest news and updates. For now, stay tuned as we cross live to our service, which has just started. Um, can we say good morning and welcome? And how wonderful as always to have you here. How wonderful it is to connect with those who might listen on the radio or who might be online as well. And we welcome you too. There is something so wonderful about the routine, or the sacredness of saying it's Sunday, it's church, and we set aside time in whatever form to be together, to be in the company of saints. And so as we engage this morning, I really pray that it would be a special and a sacred time for you. I'd like to start the service by reading from Psalm 57, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 8. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I'm just looking at you guys. Awake. Hey, are we awake? <laughs> they are awake. I've been listening to them this morning. So awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awake in the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. I wanted just to draw our attention as we gather to worship to this phrase, awake my soul, awake my soul. You know, the truth is that he is closer than our very breath. That is how close the Lord is to us. But may we know that. May we know his proximity. And David's way of preparing for worship is to say, awake my soul. And really what he's saying is, I know you there, I know you here, I know you so close, but soul, would you awaken to the proximity of God? Would you bring your conscious thoughts to God this morning? And so this is how David readies himself and prepares for worship. May we do the same this morning. So I'm going to ask you if you would mind standing with me. And if we could just, in the quietness of our hearts, go, my soul awaken this morning. Become aware of the conscious presence of God. Become aware of His presence right here with us, not just because it's Sunday in church, but always. But as we dedicate this time to worship, that we would be even more aware of the conscious presence of the Lord right with us, closer than our own breath. And so we do say to our souls awaken, and we do gather ourselves to you, Lord, to worship you joyfully, to worship you maybe quietly at some stages, but nonetheless to focus on you and to worship you. And so we, we bless you this morning. We're so happy to be so close. place to hide this weary soul, this backbone. I try 
with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond And just when I But to believe my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friends Burning in bitterness You can't just keep me moving No, you won't welcome me here From now till I walk the streets of gold
we praise you, Lord. I'd like us to sing that bridge one more time. Just the voices. I'll praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater. Yes, Lord. I'll praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. There's no one greater than you, Lord. It is you alone, oh God. We worship you, Lord. We praise your holy name. We marvel at all that you've done for us, Lord. You didn't have to, but you chose to. And we thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. We thank you for your deeds. And in response, Lord, we worship and we praise your holy name. We come before you and we bow before you in response to your holiness. We praise you, Lord. We worship you.
Jesus, you are, you are holy. This church, let's sing it. You are holy. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all, above all thrones and dominions, all powers and possessions, your
Isn't it a beautiful space that we're in? I'm not sure how doable this is, and I'm looking at my friends up there. Is it possible that we would put on the image that we saw at the very beginning with the children and the trees? I'm not sure what you, you know, when we worship, the Lord deals with us or speaks with us all individually, doesn't he? He doesn't say the same thing to all of us. I wonder what it is that the Lord distilled to you while you worshiped this morning. And it might be different to what struck me this morning. But what struck me this morning is this beautiful, beautiful image. An image that speaks of joy, of brightness, of eagerness, of freedom. And I was just so struck by freedom. The childlike faith. And sometimes we can worship like that. And sometimes we, our feet are a little bit stuck to the ground and our hands don't want to raise. And I wanted to pray for us. For the freedom. Because it's for freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. The gospel is a gospel of joy. But life gets messy, hey? And we're not always like that. So let's hold this space reverently. Father, the good news of the gospel is that it's here, your gospel's here, you are here. And with that gospel is joy. With that gospel is peace. With that gospel is freedom. Because joy, peace, and freedom are you. It's who you are and you are with us. And Father, if we find ourselves in a place where it's like our feet won't quite leave the ground and our hands won't quite raise and our voices don't really want to sing and our faces don't really want to smile and our eyes are not so bright today. Well, God, I, I know you look on us with an understanding of what our life is. I know you look on us with a deep compassion and a knowing I know that in the Trinity, when you speak of us, you speak of us with not judgment, you don't roll your eyes at us, but you know. And I ask, Father, for each one where joy and freedom have escaped, that you would minister deeply to them the life that we have in you. And we thank you for joy, Father. We thank you for the liberty to worship you so freely. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, would you like with me, it doesn't feel like a clap hands kind of day, but it feels like a, a wave and raise your hand sort of day. Would you like to just wave and raise your hands, number one, to the Lord, but number two, to the worship team? Didn't they do a beautiful job today? Hey. Oh, you want to clap? You can do that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, we love them and we thank them. I'd like to, at this stage, to take up the offering. And um, as I take up the offering, I was struck, this, it just came to my mind this morning, the scripture that says it's more blessed to give than to receive. 
And I thought to myself, oh, I don't know. I've always struggled a bit with that scripture. Sometimes I go, mm, quite like being on the receiving end as well. <laughs> but there is something so blessed about giving because it's in giving that we find that freedom. When we give of our generous words, when we give of our attention, when we give of the openness of our home, when we give of our finance, when we give of our time, our everything, when we give, we move the focus off us and we put it onto God and we put it onto others. It's a blessed place to be. The place of introspection and selfishness is not always a blessed place to be, but the place of living openly and generously is the blessed place. And so could I take up the offering with that? Please feel at liberty. May you feel that joy, that freedom, that liberty as we take up the offering. Many of you have given, um, you know that at Hatfield we have a number of ways of doing that, that you would give of your tithes, you would give of your offering, but that there wouldn't be a stuckness, you know, like, like we stuck to the ground, but that we would give from a place of joy. And um, we do that via SnapScan, via EFT, um, or by passing the bags now. Thank you. Thank you that money is not an issue in this congregation. Your hearts are free and our hearts are free. And we thank you. We thank you for your maturity in that. And we bless you for that. Earlier, I welcomed our visitors. Ach, not our visitors, our congregation. And I know we have some visitors amongst us. And we want to say to you, welcome. We trust that what we do um, doesn't make you uncomfortable, but that it just shows you and helps you imagine a better kind of life. For all of us, we need that better kind of life. So welcome to our visitors. And if you were here and you would like to know more about us, I would love to meet with you directly after the service. I will be in the Connect Lounge. We'll just chat together for about 10 minutes um, over a cup of coffee, and it would be lovely to meet you. The Connect Lounge is as you go out. Um, where I am, it's on my left-hand side, your right-hand side. So, love to meet you there. And then, if we could just have the announcements for this week. Hi, Dave. Hey, Mo. Are you perhaps ready to make a public confession of your faith? Another opportunity is coming up to go through the waters of baptism as a declaration of your new life in Christ. Baptism is a crucial step in our discipleship journey as Christians. So join us in the Function Hall on Sunday, 21 April at 9 a.m. Register by Wednesday the 17th of April by emailing hello at hatfield.co.za or via the link under the Happening at Hatfield section on our website homepage. Come meet David and I in person and journey with us through the Wholeness Course, a great foundational course that integrates theology and psychology to explain why we think, feel, and behave the way we do, and how we can find wholeness in all areas of life. The six-week course takes place every Sunday at 9 a.m. from the 21st of April in the Kopenong Hall. There is a 50 Rand cost involved which will cover your course material. Registration is essential, so sign up on or before this Thursday, 18 April by emailing hope at hatfield.co.za or visiting our website's happening section. Are you engaged or considering marriage? Becoming one, our seven-week marriage preparation course will help you as a couple build a solid foundation based on biblical principles. Topics include roles, responsibilities, communication, personality types, money, conflict, and intimacy. Register by the 21st of April for 500 Rand per couple by emailing hope at Hatfield or visiting our website. And that's all from us today. Until next time, bye. Bye-bye. So many brilliant, brilliant opportunities. I hope you take a, you know, you, you engage with some of them. Now, it's my joy. Litsolo, would you like to come up? I would like to welcome my friend Litsolo. <laughs> and... <laughs>
Maybe I shouldn't say my friend. Maybe I should say our friend, Litsolo. I think he's known and loved um, by so many of us. Litsolo, as you know, is running our congregation, the Hatfield congregation, and Shia doing a fantastic job. But Litsolo, I cannot help but saying, you are on point today, my friend. <laughs> so, Lutzolo <laughs> has a way of saying, if he thinks you dressed well, he says, oh, you're on point. I just want to say he's only ever said it to me once. <laughs> and goodness, I wish I could remember what I was wearing that day because I'd wear it again. <laughs> But, but he's always on point, our friend Litsolo, and lovely to have Anshul, his son, with us, and we welcome you to, you're here to support your dad, you're here to learn from your dad, and we welcome the two Palesi men with us today. So Litsolo, enjoy yourself in our community today. Thank you, thank you so much, Tevi. Good morning, family. It's always a privilege and an honor to be here and to share God's word with you. Without any further ado, let us jump right into it. We're going to read from 2 Kings. Let's read together. It should appear on the screens. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 to 15. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 to 15. I'm reading it from the NIV version. It should appear on the screen. It starts off by saying this. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. Because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a violent soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending you my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Hmm? Can I kill and bring back to life? Huh? Why do this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, hmm, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Me, 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 me too. <laughs> Are not Abana and Fapa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. <laughs> Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I want to thank you this morning that your word is truth, your word is life. Lord, as we unpack your word this morning, I ask that for all of us, all our hearts, Lord, and for all our souls and for all our spirit, they would be like a, a fertile soil, Lord, where your seed can fall and produce a fruit 30, 60, 
a hundredfold to your glory. We ask, Father Lord, for that. That our lives will represent nothing but what Jesus has done and who he is to us. Amen. This is a story of a man, Naaman. Somebody was just sharing with me that, you know, you can say Naaman, you can say Naaman, or you can say Naaman. And so I will stick with Naaman, somewhere in between. Naaman was a man that was a soldier, and yet not just a soldier, he was the general of the army of Syria in Aram. And in this place, as he is this top dog and this person that everybody feared, he was sick and sick of leprosy. We know that in those days, if you had leprosy, it was just like a contagious sickness. You know, like we had COVID that was contagious. And that is the last time I will say that word. Because all this time when he was sick of leprosy, he knew that he was going to lose his position as a general. That he knew he was going to die, and so there was nothing because no one could heal leprosy in those days. And so he was battling, and he was looking for a way to be free of this sickness. And so the story of Naaman shows us a man that had a, a gift of leading, of being in charge, of, of holding authority, but there was a weakness. Isn't it like that with all of us? Whereby there is a position that you hold, there is an influence that you have, but somewhere, somehow, there's a weakness. And so this man had a weakness, and his weakness in this case was his leprosy. Now, outside, it looks like leprosy, but as we read further, we start to see that there were other things that Naaman was actually struggling with. And so this morning, we want to look at the story of Naaman, where now he's, he's looking for his healing, and he's looking for a place where he can be restored from his sickness before he dies, and he wants so desperately to get help. In our lives, there are times where we desperately need help. But the story of Naaman helps us with this. And this is the title of the message this morning. It helps us to understand the God of process. The story of Naaman helps us to understand that there is a God, but he's the God of process. He's the God who doesn't just do quick things right now because we ask him. He always takes us through a process. Read your Bible, you will see from the story of Noah, there's a process. From the story of Abraham, there's a process. From the story of the Israelites, there's a process. God is a God of process. But sometimes we want him and we pray and we say, God, can you do it right now? Let me make it clear this morning. God has got only two speeds, slow and very slow. <laughs> only two speeds, slow and very slow. Yet sometimes in our lives, we are so desperate for him to respond now. And then in this case, we, we lose out on the process. Because let me tell you this morning, God desires one thing in my life, in your life, and that is character. God desires that our character can be formed into his, into his son's likeness, Jesus. For as long as that is not in place, God will never stop taking you through a process. And so this morning, I would like to highlight five main key points from our scripture. The five main points. The first one that we need to always remember whenever God takes us through a process is this. God, power, his power, God's power is always available to all of us. God's power is always available to all of us. You see, in this case, there was a challenge because Naaman was not a Jew. He was in Syria, and he felt that he couldn't associate with anybody else. 
But God wanted to show him and highlight something about it. That you may think this way about other people. You may discriminate other people in your own mind based on their culture, skin color, their tradition, their, their background. Yet God's power is always available to all. It says the Bible tells us that when, 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 when we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. It doesn't exclude anyone. So the story of Naaman tells us that God's power is available to all. God's power is there for everyone to tap into. It rains on the ungodly and it rains on the godly. And God doesn't separate or discriminate against anyone. And so when he calls Naaman and, and he says, come, respond to this, it was for us to understand the God of process. He says, my power is available for you. Like he was available for Naaman, he is available for you and I. And we must never find ourselves wondering, is God for us? Why are things not coming together? God's power is available for you. He doesn't exclude anyone. He welcomes all of us. The second point we must learn, not only is God's power always available for all of us at all times, but also God's self, the, the package in which, the special package in which he brings to us. Sometimes it's unexpected and unfamiliar. God's special package is unexpected and unfamiliar. Sometimes God uses somebody in your life to bring about a promotion or to bring about a business deal or to bring about something, good tidings, blessings towards you. Sometimes God uses people in your life to give you direction, to offer you wisdom. Sometimes God brings people in your life because he wants to provide for them through you. But because you don't like the package. You're like, ah, man, surely God can use this one. I doubt. And so we choose the package, but God says, no, 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 listen, there are times when I'm going to use a special package. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to be unfamiliar. You see, with, with Naaman, it was the same. He, he, didn't, he didn't think there could be anyone who could heal him except in Syria. He thought that his healing was definitely going to come from Syria, not anywhere else. Why would God allow that to happen? Simple. Naaman was a general. He was used to giving instructions. And now somebody is giving him instructions to say, go there and do this. He's thinking, no, man. I only answer to the king. He wanted to skip the process. But special package requires us to respond to God. To say to him that, no, it's, it's a special package. I want to respond. I want to take it. And God desires that for you and I, that we may not reject the special package that he has for us. That we may respond to him and say, God, you are the one that helps us to get where we need to be. And so for Naaman, it was like that. He thought, ah, no, surely there's no one who can do this thing. Surely, God, it's, there's no way you can use anybody else. But then in this world, we know for a fact that things don't always work like that, isn't it? That God sometimes brings people in our lives and we must respond to him. And so we must never reject the package. We must always receive the package that God has given us. I've put a picture there of a place in South Africa. It's in the Eastern Cape. It's called Isinuka. Isinuka. It's in the Eastern Cape. People go there to wash themselves, and, and they go into this lake. It's pink. The water comes out from the ground pink like that. And people believe that if they go there and they wash themselves in there, if they were ill, they will be healed. And, and all sorts of beliefs, people go there all over the world. They fly and go in this small village in Sunuka. And they, they wash themselves there so that they somehow can get some form of a miraculous healing. Some claim that they have been healed, but obviously 
I can imagine for Naaman, he thought that, you know, the rivers of Fapa and Abana, surely, you know, we have our own Sinuka here. Why must I be going anywhere else outside Syria? So surely this place can work. And so he rejected that, but God had other things in place for him. God had other purposes. Sometimes we are so comfortable that God just shakes us a little bit and says, come on, there's more for you. And so God cries out and, and he seeks out this man and he says, listen, though there may be Isinukas in your area, there's something else that I have for you. And he, you can hear how he speaks about the Jordan. He has seen the Jordan as a, as, a, as, a, as a soldier and a general. He has seen it. Jordan was filthy. It was dirty. Cows drank there and people washed their clothes there. People washed themselves. It was di- disgusting for him. And so he didn't want to go there, obviously. But God's special package, it's always unexpected and unforeseen. The third point I would like to highlight, not only his power is always for us and the special package, but to also understand that God's purpose always requires a response. God's purpose always requires our response. We don't want God to just speak and yet we do not obey and then we think God is not saying anything. Sometimes when we don't hear God, we must ask ourselves, God, what did you say the last time you spoke? Because sometimes we don't obey God and we expect God to do something, and yet we have stopped the process. God calls each one of us to respond to him. You see, with Naaman, he he first resisted. He said, no, I'm not going there. I'm going back home. And yet when his servant came and he said, no, but just, just do this. Just, just, you know, if he was asking you to stand on top of the hill and, and scream and shout, would you do it? If you had to scream and shout, I'm the greatest, you would do it. So why don't you do this one? Just do this. And then he humbled himself. Eventually he agreed and he went and he did it. What does this teach all of us? That sometimes desperation and frustrations are used by God. Desperation and frustrations in our lives are sometimes used by God. That we must not be in a place where we are stuck and we do not, we do not want to respond to God because it's not how we think it should have been like. We do not think that's how God would, would want to do something. And yet we miss out on that because we are stuck in this thing. No, God would not do it this way. You see, Naaman was humbled. His pride was humbled by the filthy waters of Jordan. God allowed him to go through there because there was something inside of him that was not clear. That was not supposed to be. And yet he he continued and he went and he did this. There's a process that needs to be in place when we walk with God. And he desires that all of us may respond to him. Respond to him in truth and in spirit. That we may be honest before him and we may obey him. Not taking chances and wondering, ah, but God, this and that. No, I'm fine with that. No, God desires that. That you will respond to him. That you would allow him to work in your life. And to allow him to be the leader in your life. And not to go about and do your own thing. That you would ask him, God, what do you say about this? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? So that later, it's not like, ah, my God, you left me alone. And where am I now? I'm lost. And so God desires that when we come to his purposes, that we may respond to him. In the right way. In the way that pleases him. And shows obedience to him. Not only his power and package and purpose, but God's process is always invisible to others. God's process is always invisible to others. What God is doing in your life, he almost puts it in a secret place because there's character that he's working on. It's not visible to others. He's working with you individually. God says, no, 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 come, I'm I'm working with you. I'm changing something in you. 
I want to, I want to make you greater, not less. And yet that time probably you are in pain, you are bothered, it's painful, it's sore, but God is working inside. He's changing you from the inside out. You see, God works with us individually. When Naaman was humbled by the waters of, of Jordan River, God was busy working inside of him to humble him, to, to help him to be humbled. You see, it's better that you humble yourself, that I humble myself before God, not for him to humble me. Disaster. I would rather acknowledge where I miss it and humble myself before God. That is his desire for all of us, that we must come and humble ourselves to him. Naaman humbled himself and he said, okay, it's fine. Let me just do it and get over with it. And yet when he did that, something changed in his life. God calls all of us and he says, all of you must come. But how he works with us, it's individual. It's unique just for you. But we are all called by him to walk with him, to work with him. And that has always been his desire. But you know, we live in the real world, real challenges, real issues. And sometimes we want to jump the process, isn't it? Er, in Setswana, they say, you're not shortcuts. We want double ups. We want to go on a route that is not meant to be and we want to take shortcuts to get to where God has called us. And for that, I've come across the story of a lady called Rosie Ruiz. Rosie Ruiz was running the Boston Marathon in 1980, the, the longest marathon in the world in terms of time and the years. And she ran and she ran and she came, she came out first. But Rosie Ruiz jumped the process. She took a shortcut. And in the end, everybody, when they were asking her about her intervals, how she finished, she just couldn't explain. So I got this clip of a minute and a half just to show you how she finished. And then she was being asked, why aren't you sweating? Why aren't you tired? And she just couldn't explain. Rosie Ruiz took a shortcut. Let's see. I just saw someone stumble out of the crowd uh, in front of me across the street. This was on Commonwealth Ave, probably about a half mile from the finish. Um, she was in track clothes and wearing a number, but I thought someone had just sort of stumbled into the race. Maybe somebody was a little crazy or something. Women's winner in the Boston Marathon today with a time of 2.31 and change. Now, we don't know how many seconds that is. It may be a new American record. Um, what, was, what was the time in your first ever marathon, and where was it? It was 2 hours and 56 minutes and 33 seconds in New York last year. And so you improved from 2, two hours and 56 minutes to 2 hours and 31 minutes. What, what, so. <laughs> what do you attribute that improvement in time to? Um, I don't know. Have you been doing a lot of heavy intervals? Um, someone else asked me that. I'm not sure what intervals are. <laughs> what are they? Well, intervals are, are track workouts that are designed to make your speed improve dramatically. And if you went from a 256 to a 231, one would normally expect that you'd do a lot of speed work. Is, is someone coaching you or advising you? Uh, no, I advise myself. <laughs> well, it was a fantastic performance, Rosie. Congratulations. Rosie Ruiz, the mystery woman winner. We missed her at all our checkpoints. She came through the finish in a fantastic 2.31. We have to confirm that time at this point, but she was way ahead of a world-class field here today in the Boston Marathon. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. Rosie Ruiz. Whenever we jump processes, we are like Rosie Ruiz. This is what they found out later, what happened. Rosie Ruiz, she was running for about three kilometers. And then she just disappeared in the crowds and she went to catch a train. And the train took her all the way to Boston and she climbed out about three k's away from the finish line. And when she came out, she was running like that and they caught her and they said, wow, oh, how did you do it? Because all the people that were running, she was, they were not even near her. The number one lady that came out, I think her name was Jennifer Grandjua, she came out first and she was so shocked that somebody could run that fast. Later they found out that really 
Rosie Ruiz did to jump the process. They asked her for the, for the medal to give it back and everything, and she said no. And they, and they decided that it's fine. Keep the medal. <laughs> and they did this whole simulation where they asked uh, Jeanette to run the next three kilos, and they got people to come and clap for her and make her the official winner of the 1980 Boston Marathon. What do we learn from this story? Never ever jump the process. God is a God of process. He doesn't want us to, to jump and, and, and come out of the process that he has for us. And so let us always remember that when the process gets tough, our call is to put our eyes on him and persevere. Because God is a God of process. And so it was the same with Naaman. He had to respond to God and, and understand that God was doing something in his life. And that God was working individually in his life. On his pride and his issues. And the last fifth point I would like to highlight is this. Not only his power, not only his, his special package or his purpose, not, not only his process, but God's progress is always evident to all. God's progress is always evident to all. Everybody will see what God has done, what God has changed in your life when you allow the process to, to happen in you. You see, the process is, is hidden. It's in, a, it's in a secret place with God, but the progress is always evident. The fruit is always evident. Evident. You long for that, that God can, can show the fruit in your life. In Naaman's life, it was, it was healing. He had, he had healing, and his healing was his testimony. It was to show that God has, has done something, not only inside, but God has done something on the outside. God calls us consistently to process. He calls us and he says, come, I have more for you. Because God will never leave himself without witness in your life. God will always put a fingerprint somewhere in the journey of your life. Your response is so key to him to do exactly that. To say, God, I'm willing that you would walk with me through my process. That you would lead me through my process. And that you would respond to him, just like Naaman did, and he was healed. And he glorified God for his healing. God desires the same for you. I've brought with me today a tennis ball. A friend of mine shared this tennis ball illustration with me, and I thought I should use it today so that appropriate. A tennis ball, sometimes I look at it, since I've, I've received this illustration before, I have always thought, wow, that's amazing. Because our lives sometimes are like this tennis ball. And a tennis ball, it's something that needs to bounce. And it needs to bounce. And sometimes our lives, we think this is how far God wants us to go. And we only go this far. But God is the one who created us. And he knows what he has put inside of us. And sometimes when things are going well and we don't have a problem or when things are going well, we feel like everything is fine. But God always desires more because he knows what's inside of you. And then so now sometimes God goes, okay, let's, let's take this life higher to where it belongs. And God puts a little bit of pressure and we go higher. And yet we cry out, but God says, I have more in you. And then we go higher. And we go higher. And I want to actually put this mic down and I want to show you. Because God doesn't desire that you just come out and you, you only land here. But he always desires that you would go higher. God desires that our lives will go higher. But for that to happen, we must allow a process. Very interesting enough, 
The higher we go, perhaps we get afraid. And we say, are you going to catch me, Lord? And every time when you come down, he catches you. Because he will never let you be destroyed. And he catches you every single time. But the issue comes in this world we live in where sometimes we, we put our trust in people. And when we say people must catch us, they can't. That is exactly what happens. When God says, cursed is anybody who puts their trust in God, blessed is the man and woman who puts their trust in the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord. Don't allow yourself to go out of process. Allow God to be the one who leads you through the process. I want to end with this sentence. Miracles are an exception, but process is always normal. Miracles are an exception, but process is always normal. As you walk with God in your process with him, you will experience the miracle he has for you. But sometimes we want the miracle, and when we say pro process, emanyan, just wait a little bit. Vach, vach. And yet we can't experience it. So I want to encourage all of us this morning. Let us learn from the story of Naaman. 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 <laughs> and say that God help us in our process. I don't know if you are here this morning. And you feel that edge from God who says I want you to go higher. Or you hear God saying that you are, you are out of the process that he has for you. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you that you will cry out to God and say, God, help me. I don't want to get out of your process so I can experience your miracle. Because it's only through that that God works with us. If it's you and you are here this morning, I would like to invite you to stand and let's pray together. That God can help us in our processes. That we wouldn't jump out of the processes because it's tough. That we may ask God to persevere and to hold on even when it's not that easy. Father, you know each and every person's life this morning. You know their hearts. You know who they are. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be with them this morning. That whatever process they are experiencing, that whatever process they are walking in, that you would be there. That, Lord, you would help them not to take a shortcut because it's so hard to walk this process. I pray, Lord, that you will remind them, I'm the God of process, and I'm with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Whether it's in work, whether it's with relationship, whether it's in their finances, in the business, in every aspect of their lives that you are working in, Lord, help all of us to walk the process. The process that you have for us. In the name of Jesus. We bless your name, almighty God. We bow before your throne. We bless your name, almighty God. We bow before your we bless your name, we bless your name, oh, almighty God. We bow, we bow before you, we glorify, we glorify your holy name, Kawe. We glorify, we glorify your holy name. Kawe tawela matka. We magnify, we magnify your holy name. Kawe. We magnify, we magnify your holy name. Kawe, Kawe, 
Jesus, we thank you, Father. It is in you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that it is in you that, Lord, we will see our miracles take place because it's in the process we want to remain with you. May your name be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. Thank you. Yo, thank you so much to Pastor Lutzolo. He's just given us some images today, hasn't he? I think we're all going to go away with Rosie Ruiz somewhere with us, aren't we? <laughs> I think we're going to go away with the tennis ball. We're going to remember these things. And thank you for giving us hooks to hold during the course of this week. Thank you so much. Thank you for your beautiful ministry today. We so, so, so appreciate it. As always, if you would like prayer, it doesn't matter what it's for, if you don't know the kind of life that we have spoken about today and you would like to be introduced to Jesus, please would you come forward. If you would like prayer for anything specific, if you would come forward, our pastors and elders and others will be, or, and prayer team, sorry, will be here with you to pray. So please just feel a liberty. This is your home. This is your place to come and to pray. If you are not in the building, but you are online, please would you also feel free to contact us that we could pray for you. And the way you could do that is to um, just email prayforme at hatfield.co.za. And then finally, or just one before finally, remember if you would like to come and have a cup of coffee and you're not a member and you'd maybe like to become a member and meet with me in the Connect Lounge now, that would be wonderful. But before, the last thing I'd like to do before we go is I'd like to ask you to stand and I want to pray the blessing over you, but I want to pray it my way, <laughs> if that's okay. So this is what I want to pray. May you know that the Lord really does bless you. May you know that the Lord keeps you. May you know that his face really does shine upon you. May you know that he is gracious to you. May you know that the Lord turns his face towards you. And may you know the peace that he gives, the peace that passes all understanding. Amen. Amen. Here's where we say goodbye. If you have any prayer needs, send an email to prayforme at hatfield.co.za and our ministry team will gladly serve you. To be connected to our community or find out more, send an email to hello at hatfield.co.za or simply visit our website homepage and scroll down to the Happening at Hatfield section. Bye-bye.